Hey, greetings everyone. Gleecon back again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we were playing through World of Warcraft Classic in the Darkshore region with our Night Elf Druid, who has a new name, sort of. Um, and we just kind of ran around. We did some of the Bashal around, MF around quests. Um, did a little bit of Druid quests. We killed some rabid bears, quite a lot of them. Rabies is uh, endemic throughout um, the Darkshore region. So we caught it even at the end. It was not pleasant. Got a little hydrophobia there. All right. So um, we've also been reading the Alliance Player's Guide. And in that, we last finished Chapter 2, which talked about different class options. Nothing really jumping out. Just like, hey, if you want to be an Ancient, if you want to be a Protector of the Grove, um, really racial classes, and then some archetypal classes. So stay a while and listen as we now bust out the third chapter. This is probably right up there among the longest chapters in the book, but we're going to glance, like, just breeze through it. We're not going to read every word. So what this chapter is all about is the prestige classes, and there are a ton. Um, I almost feel like there are too many that they stretch too far. Um, and, and we'll see if uh, we agree or you agree with me and, and, and we'll talk about each one as we go. But first, let's open it up by saying your might cannot be matched. Um, it says these are particularly appropriate for members of the Alliance or Alliance races, but most of them could be taken by anybody. And here's a little story to get us started. Jinxo cowered in the back of her cage whenever the orcs came to visit her. She figured the best way of going about her incarceration was to pretend to be as frightened as possible. Granted, she was terrified of the hulking things, but she knew she could escape at any time. The lock to her cage was pitiful. She could pick it with a strong twig, but once picked, she had no idea where she would go or if she could outrun her captors. She had to get a weapon. They were part of a caravan, moving. No windows lined her compartment, so she had no idea in which direction they were moving. She bided her time and carefully inventoried the interior of the wagon. She could likely cobble together a small bomb with the junk in the wagon, but she would need gunpowder. It was difficult to work without tools at first, but she had nothing else to do with her time, and it kept her busy. The caravan kept moving. One morning, she heard what seemed to be the sounds of a town around her. It was easy to figure out now. Gadget Stan. The orcs spoke to a goblin outside the caravan, apparently dealing to sell her. She was to be a slave to a goblin. She began to smile, cradling her bomb to her chest. This was going to be easy. All right, so I was thinking that sounded like a goblin, but it might be a Jinxo. Uh, maybe that's a gnomish name. Either way, it's obviously a rogue tinker kind of class. All right, so here is the first, and they go alphabetically from A all the way up. I think there's a few Ws. This first one's called Ace. The saying goes, any tinker can pilot a vehicle, but only the truly gifted can be the vehicle. The thrill of high-flying combat sings to a particularly few foolhardy types who forego all worldly pursuits to become one with their vehicles, flying barons of destruction. These few brave and exemplary souls are known as aces. An ace is a master of the wheel, a vehicular expert with no equal. The thrill of the dive bomb, the rush of wind past his goggled face, the roar of the phlogiston engines beneath him. These are things that give life meaning to aces. While the ace is a master of any vehicle he can get his hands on, the ace is truly free only while in the air. Throughout his training, the ace gains sharp wits and quick hands, and even outside the cockpit, he's always on the verge of moving. Every action is graceful, every word sharp and cocky, and his eyes forever look toward the horizon. For the flyboys of the world, every day is a new experience, and every moment on the ground is wasted when one can be soaring in the set heavens. And this makes this calls to mind, say, the... Um, gyrocopter flyers that are gnomes so aces in the world it says these are pretty much alliance because it's the dwarves and gnomes that fly around in the flying machines but i i could see goblins being some kind of flying machine as well um it, and that's what they say in the next paragraph goblins could also but they would be flying war zeppelins or other aeronautical nightmares um there is a at least one notable goblin ace and actually i think he is, it says, um, he Lords of the Sky, notable aces when we get to them, but I'm pretty sure you actually talk about him and encounter him in, in Classic. Um, they basically are, it says whether they're mercenary or enlisted, what their 
pretty much preoccupied with is just being awesome at flying and, and testing the boundaries of their skill. Um, so they take advantage of a special technological device or magic item to bring their vehicles with them. So it says most of them will have some, basically like a pocket aircraft. Um, aces are most likely suited to be tinkers, um, makes sense. And they respect warriors and, and barbarians. So there's a respect for them but, and they dis, distrust the magical, um, the magical races. They, you have to be good at spot and you have to be extremely good at technological device and must have vehicle proficiency with air vehicles. Um, okay, so they gain Ace's Touch, which lets them basically be even um, like a complete master at tech skills so long as they're working on their vehicle. They have a vehicular mastery, which gives them extra work ability of working on their vehicle, aerial evasion. So they gain, it's like an evasion feat like the Rogue has, except you can use it when they're in their plane. Shot on the wing. So they're basically good at shooting while they fly. Dog fighting, I'm guessing, yeah, they get extra armor class when they are fighting other flying creatures. Um, this is a, up to 10 levels of prestige that you can take bombs away. Uh, they do extra damage when bombing. They uh, pound a weakness, so they can they're ex they can ignore when they're basically good at fighting other vehicles. They have extra maneuverability, um, maximum burn, so they can create uh, an extra burst of speed, like a nitro burst almost. So some of the notable aces, the Lords of the Sky, there's Gavel or Gavel Thunderblast. Swooping along in his flying machine, preying on bandits and other evildoers, Gavel is a gnome of unparalleled skill in the air. He's only lost once or twice in his long life. Part of an elite group of aces known as the Thundering Rockets, Gavel claims he has more sorties under his belt than half the dwarves who fought in the Third War. While he could not fight in the Third War due to difficulties in his homeland, he regrets both the loss of his city to the Trogs and his inability to do anything for the Alliance in its greatest time of need. Gavel realizes he's getting old, already well into his second century. These days, he spends time at Bailmondon working on his ship, the Grease Lightning, and teaching new aces the art of aerial combat. Ooh, we should be encountering these people soon. Zigni the Insane. No one knows where the go this goblin came from, but most along the coast of Kalimdor learn to fear the power of this aerial pirate. Perhaps the most eccentric of the master aces, Zigni made a name for himself in his own vessel, Ratchet's Wings. His vessel consists of nothing more than a large phlogiston engine with guide wings strapped to his back. Controls extend down his arms and feet, which not only control the speed and direction of the rocket engine, but a pair of auto-loading rapid-fire cannons tacked onto the wings. Others often underestimate him, which can prove fatal for caravans and aerial transports. While looking half-cobbled, Zygni and his wings prove themselves with frightening skill and efficiency. Often, the most emergent hears is a loud cackling over a roar of powerful engine before the cannons rip his vehicle apart and the goblin flies away with the loot. And Angus Sootbeard, one of the young and upcoming aces. Angus is a rare Ironforge dwarf techno mage. Um, that's Lands of Mystery. That's a previous book that we read where they talked about that, that class. With a definite addiction to extremes. Rising to fame with the creation of his one true love, the T-Bird, Angus works as a mercenary, taking odd jobs for the Alliance when he's not pursuing new technological and magical projects. His ship is a fully enclosed vessel bearing a cargo bay large enough to hold an ogre or two, often filled with either bombs or warriors ready to parachute below. While many create similar vehicles, his is the first to be powered by an elemental. He bound into a marvelous single engine on the back, giving him an endless source of power, as well as unparalleled speed and control. While the elemental co-pilot is rather finicky at times, they have a decent working relationship. The vessel at first seems unarmed, but Angus has set several wands aimed in various directions. Most expel lightning-powered lashes. Few can withstand the combined power of technological genius and magical might. I don't know if any of those are in the game, but they seem cool. <laughs> There's some cool ideas. I got to give it to the creators of the book. I, I was a little bit negative on some of the previous episodes. Hey, it's not all negative. Um, that was neat. That was these are some neat ideas. All right, up to the D's here with a dead shot. The dead shot is the hidden warrior, one who is part patient, one part patient, and three parts skill. She's the one who serves as a line of defense. 
a patient assassin or a failsafe in case of tense diplomatic meeting goes poorly. She's a specialized assassin, able to slay with one painstaking shot from rifle or crossbow. So maybe a rogue. Although many associate the dead shot with the gun, many dead shots, notably night elves, are skilled with the bow or crossbow. They all share the qualities of a sharp eye and almost a natural patience. The dead shot is skilled, of course, in specific ranged attacks, but she also has abilities that allow her to melt into the background, wait for hours on end for her prey to appear, and spot a sparrow in a tree 300 yards away. So they're snipers, basically. Um, any range that can pick up a ranged weapon could become this, um, but most are either Iron Dwarf Sharpshooters or Night Elves. But yeah, anything really could be this. Um, so they're basically just saying how a human could do it, maybe like with a crossbow or gun. Um, they have a strong stamina, which is what helps them with their patience and the intellect helps them if they want to like work on their own guns. They're not charismatic. They don't blink, they don't itch, they don't sneeze. A few dead shots are impatient, uh, where most people consider patience to be the ability to sit through long diplomatic meetings or deal calmly with unruly prisoners. Most dead shots make no rash decisions, no matter what. They're slow to anger and view every problem with a cool, calculating manner, acting only when they feel it necessary. This quality is useful in military circumstances, but in life, dead shots prove to be infuriating individuals devoid of passion or spontaneity. Yeah, so... Basically, they're backup troops. They're lethal at point blank or far away. They are. Um, they like to work with tinkers because they can help them with their guns. Scouts and beastmasters make good uh, classes for them, but they're mostly solo people. Um, they have to. Basically, you have to be at least a certain level, I guess, around at least three, and you need to already be working on being a stealthy sniper. Um, yeah, that's about it. And we'll we'll get into more of it, but they have some notable dead shots. Deadly Peep. Peppa Santo is short, short even for a gnome. Always overlooked as a child, she developed a watchful eye and allowed little to escape her gaze. Even in gnome society, her elders considered her too small to excel in much. Always able to beat her brothers and sisters at skipping stones and other throwing games, she caught the eye of her uncle, a weapons engineer. He trained her in throwing knives and axes. Praising her sharp eye, he introduced her to bows. She worked a great deal on her upper body strength, and when she turned 15, her uncle gave her her first firearm. Although deadly with a knife or other thrown object, she greatly prefers her golden-laid long rifle, a gift from her uncle when she entered the Alliance forces. The Alliance accepted her because they were desperate for soldiers, but didn't take her seriously, still considered too small to enter combat. Her commanding officer placed her on a hill, assuming she'd be unable to harm her herself or others from that vantage point. Papa killed 18 orcs that day and earned herself the nickname Deadly Peep. She carries a rifle as tall as she is and is often her commanding officer's ace in the hole. Arwen Sorrow. Self-renamed after his family died in the Third War, this night elf spent a good month hunting in the desolate areas of Fellwood Forest, carrying only his bow. He soon got into the habit of shooting everything that moved, as most everything that moved in the sickened forest was intent on doing him harm. Although his eye is sharp and unforgiving, he is quick to judge, sometimes too quick. Although the Night Elves know he would be an asset to their military, they fear diplomatic upheavals if he shoots someone without considering their affiliation. The Night Elves sent him on unofficial missions to help clear Ashenvale of monsters and intruders, believing that deep in the forest is the best place to keep him. Perhaps time alone will heal his grief. And gruff slate gray. Dwarves don't go to sea, dwarves do not become pirates, and yet tales exist of gruff slate gray. Kidnapped for his skill in making firearms, he supplies a pirate gang with arms. Once when the Alliance attacked, Gruff realized that although he was a prisoner, he had to help keep the ship afloat in order to survive. So he climbed to the top of the mast with a rifle he got off a dead body and shot Alliance sailors who were attempting to set fire to the ship. It broke his heart a little bit each time he shot one down, and now he lives a life of self-loathing, missing his mountains but forced to aid the pirates when they come under fire. His time with weapons and ammunition is closely monitored, but he is developing a plan and may someday turn against his captors, whether he goes down with the ship or not. He knows that he's done too much damage to the Alliance to ever rejoin it, but he has learned enough of the sea to dream of touring in his own ship, gathering exiles and vagabonds like himself. Yet first, he must escape, and second, he must do so alive. So these dead shots, again, 10 levels of prestige classes. Um, they can target their foe, which after selecting a target, they then get a bonus to their next shot. They also gain the eagle eye feet, um, which is cool, They, which is a, a regular hunter move.
they have vigilance. So basically they can stay awake for 24 hours waiting for their shot. Um, they can shadow meld and they can remain invisible even when sniping. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, well, easier than normal. They upgrade their weapon so they can work on it to make it stronger. And they have one shot, one kill. So they can take one full action to make one lethal massive shot. That's, that's pretty sick. Okay, cool. So the third one now, we're going to talk about Demon Hunters stealing the Ds. Now this is going to be interesting because as we know, Demon Hunter is definitely not an alliance thing and comes with being part demon. So is this the Demon Hunters that we know of or is this some other um, just concept basically? Demon Hunters are dark and shadowy warriors. Illidan Stormrage is the most infamous Demon Hunter and was the first of their kind. Even Illidan's own brother did not appreciate his sacrifice and locked him below ground for thousands of years for trafficking with dark powers. Illidan's case was unique. Sargeras, Lord of the Burning Legion, burned away Illidan's eyes with magic fire and only scorched sockets were made. Illidan's resulting sight was a maddening display of violent, color violent colors. His altered vision allowed him to easily recognize both demons and mortals with magic powers. In addition, Sargeras covered Illidan's body with black tattoos that increased his arcane power. Later, a group of night elves, inspired by Illidan's example, made a pact to turn the Burning Legion's powers against it, fighting destruction with destruction. Obviously, they could not gain their powers in the same way Illidan did, but they discovered other means. In the millennia since, other night elves and a few creatures of other races have made the same pact, binding demonic essence in their bodies and using it to destroy the Legion's minions. Demon hunters have a variety of abilities that assist them in destroying demons, though the power coursing through their bodies also allows them to prevail over lesser foes. Demon hunters eschew heavy armor valuing mobility and speed. As a demon hunter grows in power, she undergoes a gradual evolution, becoming more and more demonic in appearance. The changes are cosmetic and can take many different forms, from burning eyes to black blood. By the time the demon hunter reaches the pinnacle of her development, she is a twisted and dark version of her former self, though the chaotic energy in her body does not affect her personality and allegiance, or so the demon hunters claim, it wreaks great changes on her physical form. Okay, that does sound like demon hunters, except that they, blood elves can do it too. All right, so night elves mostly shun demon hunters, makes sense, and most other cultures do so as well. Um, most people won't even allow a, a demon hunter in because they're ignorant of what they truly are and they look freaking scary. Um, the tradition comes out of night elf history, so most are night elves, but it does say even here, a few blood elves make the pledge as well. So if you wanted to have a horde one, you could. It says any race could be it, but... Almost all are night elves or blood elves. I, yeah, exactly. I want to know why could a, a, a non-elf not be a demon hunter? I want to open it up. I want that to happen. I think that'd be sick. Unless there's uh, like more lore stuff we have to get into about why that wouldn't work. Um, they have a demonic aura, which lets them sense demons. They have enlightenment, which lets them get, basically have blind sight. They have evasion, so they're and they get to fight with their war blades. They have extra damage and armor class against demons. They're better at dodging. They can do the mana burn power, which what's that let them do? No, they they, they can cast the spell mana burn as a as a spell like power. They have a demon drain, um, and can use dark metamorphosis as a power more than one time a day, which we'll get to. They have immolation, which is one of their powers. Improved Warblade, Improved Evasion. The Dark Metamorphosis is a spell-like ability. Um, it doesn't really say. Maybe we'll get to that later, or maybe it did it in a previous book. But I'm guessing it's pretty much what we're used to from Classic, which is interesting because we're, we're, we're in the middle of Burning Crusade when this book comes out, so we're so far away from this being a playable class, and yet they have so much of it ready already. Demonic Ascendance, which is max level, they basically turn into what we are used to seeing a demon hunter look like. Um, and so they are treated as demons, like whole person, for instance, would work on them. And then they have a greater warblade at that point. And that's it. We don't have any other than Illidan. They don't have any examples of sick um, demon hunters. So, okay. All right, moving a little forward in the alphabet to the E's with an exemplar. Battlefields are bloody places, but they're also the proving grounds of heroes. Among the many legendary feats of bravery are the deeds of exemplars, men and women who strike fear into the hearts of their enemies through intimidation and demoralization. They also inspire courage in their allies, holding their banners high and charging into battle, shouting encouragement to those who ride beside them. 
To be an exemplar is to sacrifice a great deal of freedom in pursuit of a path that's narrower than warriors or paladins. However, few individuals are as honored as an exemplar, as having a capable exemplar in an army's midst can mean the difference between glorious victory and bloody defeat. This is basically like an Oridin. Um, yeah, it says because of that, paladins pretty much are what they do this. You need an aura. You need to be able to buff those around you um, because they're not real fighters. That's what they say. Um, have to be lawful. And you have to be noble. They would protect the flag power. So as long as they hold that flag, they're tougher. They have standard defense. Again, they gain extra armor while holding their standard. Here's a picture of one. This is weird. Um, 10 levels of prestige class. They can rally those around us for extra saving throw. They can shake the resolve of the enemy to give them a penalty to saving throws in armor class because they like they get spooked when they see this standard. They have a battled voice, which means that basically they can shout and be heard all across the battlefield around them. They can charge with their banner, which they gain extra armor class while they're charging, and their allies do as well. They have a fearsome mean. Um, so basically, at, once they get to that level, which is we're starting to get to at fourth level, they shake and literally shake the uh, opponents that they're coming across. They have fire resolve. Um, they gain extra bonus to armor class and saving throws while they're holding the standard. Um, and the more people in the fight, the, the more people they affect. Cool. Capture the flag. Um, they sh if they fight another flag bearer, it doesn't even have to be one of their class. They basically can whoop that thing's butt. Um, battle wind. It, they can heal. Blinding light, probably what it sounds like. Yeah, they can basically make their banner exude a blinding light. And smiting legion uh they the people the people around them all get holy strikes their banners are used to identify and guide the movement of troops in mass battles and they depict the emblem of a family religious sect adventuring party town or nation typically made from heavy cloth and costing 5 gp they last for six months before they require replacing in most climates longer in an arid climate normally they have a hardness of two and five hit points okay that's an incredibly niche class who um, I, again, this is one of those where if you were doing like a massive war, it would be cool to include one, but why would you ever want to play one? Just seems, unless you did like some kind of huge, massive tabletop group with like 50 people and you're all playing, it just seems crazy. I, I can't imagine that being cool. All right, so now we're up a little bit more onto G's for gunmen. Which, why do we need a difference between a gunman and a sniper? But okay. The gunman is a knight on the cutting edge of weapons development. He takes the newest technological inventions and through a combination of innate skills and careful study, pushes them beyond the limits their creators imagined. While some warriors favor the sword or the axe or the bow, the gunman favors guns. Pistols, rifles, blunderbusses, he's adept at them all. He's capable of performing amazing stunts with his firearms that leave others staring with wide eyes. A typical gunman carries several weapons, almost all of them firearms, a long rifle and blunderbuss are slung across his back. Pistols rest in holsters on his hips, at his back, on his shins, beneath his arms, and in several other secret places. Bandoliers hold ammunition and gunpowder, say the word, and pistols leap into his hands, blazing a fusillade of death. Gunmen claim that their abilities are purely the result of their skill, training, and natural ability. Their accuracy and quickness are impressive, but not based on magical en enhancement or any sort of divine inspiration. However, gunmen are hard-pressed to say, how their training makes the power of magic weapons cling to their hands, or how they're able to draw and fire over a dozen pistols in the space of a few seconds. You know what this makes me think of? If you've ever seen the old movie Desperado um, with Antonio Banderas, for some reason, this is what I'm picturing. Um, super cool movie for my like middle school self. Gunmen in the world, they're most common among the dwarves because night elves prefer the bows, but you can also see humans picking this up and Wild hammer dwarves, shrivels, and stuff—they don't even use guns, so it would be weird. Uh, but so basically, dwarves and humans—they're um, rare in the horde. But why the heck not? Like I could see a goblin doing this, even a tauren. Like I mean, anybody really. They have to have good agility because they have to be good at shooting. You have to be good at ex proficient with guns. 
Um, they gain bonus feats from so they can get to they get to pick extra um, gun shooting feats. They also have a stunt shot, so they can do, they get to pick a stunt shot like they shoot behind between their legs, around a head, whatever. Um, and so they're very good at that kind of thing. And the they basically. It says they take a minus penalty, but they gain an extra bonus to, to attack and damage rolls. So the, if they keep doing stunt shots, when they finally do shot, do shoot, basically they're, they are awesome at it. So it's hard to sh hit with the stunt shots, but they can get better. Uh, they're like psyching themselves up. They can make themselves a special gun. They can be skilled with a blunderbuss, like a shotgun. They get improved armor class from cover. At the whites of their eyes, they get when they're in close range fighting with guns, they're extra good. They can quickly swap their pistols out, um, like instantly, essentially. They can shoot from the hip, so they can basically draw and shoot very quickly. They're normally you that's almost impossible. They have an attack penalty when they do it. They have a bayonet charge, so they're better at doing that. They have a double barrel blast at max level where they can either shoot with two guns or shoot with both barrels of a shotgun to basically shoot two for one. Um, and that's their max move. So they basically get to shoot two guns at a time, which that's cool. And that's it, no special gunmen. So I guess they're, they're running dry and now we're jumping up to the middle of the alphabet with M for Mountain King. The most respected and revered of the Ironforged Dwarves warriors, Mountain Kings represent mighty champions of their race. While some Ironforged Dwarves are enamored of the new firearms and others unlock the secrets of their Titan heritage, Mountain Kings continue a legacy that has existed for millennia. This is a legacy of beer, blood, booze, and thunder, of red glinting axes and crushing hammers. It is a legacy continued by some of Ironforge's most renowned heroes, including Murad and Bronzebeard, deceased brother of King Magni of Ironforge. Mountain Kings boast prodigious combat abilities. They are ferocious in melee combat, wielding the traditional weapons of their race to decimate their foes. Their attacks leave opponents stunned and reeling. While they do not focus their efforts on discovering the secrets of the Titans, they have long known of a powerful spark within every Ironforged Dwarf, and the Mountain Kings draw upon this spark and fan it into a raging flame. Um, they conjure magic hammers and axes to hurl at their targets, stunning and slowing them so they can get close enough to use their real weapons. They transform themselves into silver sheen creatures of living stone, shrugging off all attacks and hacking through flesh and bone with frightening ease. Kind of like a warrior uh, nowadays in retail. Um, also makes me think of like some of the Lord of the Rings, like Gimli, um, also uh, Bruinor from the uh, Forgotten Realms campaign setting. He fights with Dritz. These are the things that kind of make me think of this character. Uh, they are the champions. Any kind of creatures. Um, yeah, they have to be Ironforged Dwarves, though, basically. It does say... Um, it doesn't really say much else about them. Like, in terms of, I was looking for something else could be considered a Mountain King. But no, they just seek out the enemies of the Dwarves. Um, they are indebted to the Alliance. And they like to prove themselves against heroic type foes. They wield their big axes. Um, these are also referred to as thanes. Um, yeah, they, they need strength and stamina. They are good at fighting within mountains or caves. They have cleave and bludgeon skills automatically and get extra weapons with the, uh, bonuses with all the basic dwarven weapons. They have a staggering blow. They can have a big storm hammer, basically a spell-like ability. Um, and they can use their hero point to activate it as well. They can also do thunderclap, slice, and swing. Um, they basically gain extra damage uh, when they're when they're cleaving. A dazing blow, and then they can go into avatar form, which is actually what they call it, what you call it. Now, here we have a little story about a mountain king. Marik took a few moments to study the massive rock at the end of the tunnel, finally nodding to himself. Carefully, the goblin lift took two of his bags, removed their contents, and started pushing the small satchels, satchels into various spots around the boulder. Sometimes he paused and studied the rock, even tapping it with his knuckles a few times. From a safe distance, Emor motioned to Von Ter, speaking in a whisper, What is he doing now? Who knows what goes through a goblin's head at times like these, replied the paladin with a shrug. 
Don't worry, though. How many old goblin sappers do you know? If you live this long, you must be doing something right. Just watch. Don't get too close. The goblin performed his work for several more minutes before retreating, unspooling a line of copper wire as he did so. His free hand trailed a bag with the few remaining charges he hadn't set. Ready for a big boom? Marie asked with a toothy grin that split his face in two. See how the bags are placed? Oh yes, the blast goes sideways, doesn't it? No shrapnel and dust, no fire into the chamber beyond. And if another collapse comes, it was unavoidable anyway. See? Mm, yes, agree, said Von Terre. There's no way to know how stable this area is anyhow. Go ahead when you're ready. Oh yes, this one'll be pretty. So pretty. One big rock into many little rocks, cackled the goblin. He paused for only a moment before doing something with a spool of wire in his hand, a kind of twisting motion with his fingers. There was a crack that split the air, and the boulder at the end of the hall burst into a thousand fragments. Emor didn't see what happened to those fragments because the cloud of dust that swept down the hall obscured all vision. The only things he could sense after that were the rush of air as the wind struck him, the giggling glee of the goblin by his feet, and the rumbling of the fractured stone collapsing at the end of the passageway. Except that the rumbling didn't stop. It changed, and the dust... As the dust settled, the warrior realized he wasn't hearing an avalanche or collapsing rocks anymore. This was something else. Something alive. Emor's sword came out of its scabbard almost of its own accord. Something had been buried behind that boulder long ago, and now thanks to Marie's skill with explosives, it was awake and free. I think, said Von Terre, as he too reached for his weapon, that sometimes maybe we're too curious for our own good. Um, I'm guessing that story is actually going to go with our next class, the Sapper. But real quick, the Mountain King also has a Stone Flesh power, which is giving him OP Armor class and a Stunning Strike. Um, and now it just activates, his Dazing Glow activates more often. And no of those. All right, so now we're jumping up into S's. So we're progressing through the alphabet even more. We just had a story about a Sapper and... This is that next prestige class. Description, kaboom. If ever a sound was associated with a particular class, it's this one. Quite simply, sappers love to blow things up. However, unlike many goblin tinkers, they don't necessarily like the idea of killing themselves in the process, which is weird because that's exactly what sappers do. No, to a sapper, the fiery blast of a good explosion is a form of art unto itself. Some spend a great deal of their lives trying to find new and interesting ways to generate beautiful, classy explosions. Sappers are experts in all sorts of explosive devices, from small firecrackers to powerful c charges capable of blowing holes in thick castle walls. Even when they don't have a prepared explosive available, a good sapper can put one together out of whatever natural materials he can find lying around. Um, most sappers die. Uh, it's mostly goblins, but there can also be dwarven sappers, which is, I guess, where the alliance comes into play. And at this point, sappers are neutral, so I would 100% put this in the horde handbook of, of more likely powers but whatever um they basically just have to be good with the explosive type this is a gnomish one yeah gnomish sapper that could also work because you pretty much want to be a tinker because you need the tech device and stuff um so they have f a bonus feat with bombs they are fire scarred basically they have resistance to fire they get an enhanced yield so they do extra damage with their explosives they are an explosives expert um they are better at making using not setting off bombs they are bomb cobblers so they can very quickly improvise bombs um, they have an evasion which that's it so they're which that just helps in all the explosions they have to dodge they are precision grenadiers so they're better at hitting with their bombs um, they have improved evasion so they're even better at, at dodging when they get much higher and ultimately they get massive explosion that's their ultimate power they can spend double the time to do a gigantic um explosion that does massive damage automatically max die damage okay so my guess is this little story we're going to have right here is going to go with the next creature which is called a savage kin Working her way up toward the living quarters, Aliastra's packs killed three small groups of ogres before Tonma finally raised the alarm and came upon the escapees with their full fury. By the time they killed the best of the Tonma, the Savage Kin's pack had lost nearly half of the wolves and a third of the saber cats, but they'd reached the upper levels of the caverns, and through cracks in the ceiling, daylight was shining. All the better to see the dead and the dying. The wolves stood over their fallen and howled. 
Aliastra, still in night saber form, walked to each of the dying and licked their faces in respect. Like old human soldiers, the night sabers peered at her with the serenity of the battle worn. Glorious, one of the night sabers told her. Want to remember, he added as he closed his eyes for the final time. It was unlike the cats to wax philosophic except regarding food. However, there was no time to pause for eulogies nor to care for the wounded. They would have to stagger as best they could and fight. Aliastra leapt to the head of the pack and roared. Both wolf and night saber snapped to attention. They roared and howled in response. Daylight calls us, she growled, and she led the charge to the door. Brutal bloody steps followed. The last remnants of Tonma's valor stood against them, and like children before a relentless surf, they were swept aside by a tide of violence. The pack crashed through the gates and emerged into the open air. So this is obviously some kind of druid prestige class, the most primal of the druids. They bear an ancient but obscure legacy, whereas some druids seek to command nature or bond with it, the savage kin surrenders himself to the natural world, abandoning much of her humanity to live with the beasts. Those who adopt this role may find they pay a steep price for their power. Savagekins are druids who spend most of their time in animal form. They travel in packs with their fellow beasts. As animals, they gain strength and finesse, but come close to become irreversibly feral. Savagekin constantly battle the inner beasts that threaten to consume them, clinging to the last vestiges of their sentience. So says they're most commonly half-elves, because those people already don't feel comfortable in their skin. Um, but sure, any race that can become a druid... You have to be able to wild shape, which is mostly a druid thing. Um, they gain, it says they have beast checks. So when they use certain things that are not animal-like, they have to make a beast check to see if they actually are too bestial to do it or not. So it's a penalty. But be, they gain a, an improved wild shape. Uh, they can indefinitely stay in their animal form. They can speak with animals. They gain an extra survival checks. Um, they're better at tooth and claw, which um, which is basically they're, they go into a barbarian rage in animal form. They can summon more allies and better allies with them. They gain bonuses to their rage as they level up. They have beastly abilities, so they're getting the penalty to those like intelligence, charisma abilities, but then they're also gaining agility, stamina, strength. Um, if they have an animal companion, they, they can also take that shape they can go into an animal trance um i don't it, it's just a spell like ability i don't know exactly what it does i guess it's a spell we'd have to look and see what that one does they also gain animal power so they can buff themselves with one of the stat buffs like bull's strength or cat's grace they gain extra wild shape unlimited wild shape large wild shape extra companions animal growth on themselves at at will once they get to seventh level tiny shape, huge shape, magic beast shape, and ultimately their ultimate power is some army of animals, which is a mega summon nature's ally spell. Okay, continuing along the S's, we now have the Sister of Steel. A lot of S's. In this time of conflict, members of both genders take up sword and axe and shield and march to the front lines. However, due to long tradition, more men than women become soldiers. As conflicts continue, men become noticeably scarcer, in Stormwind, Ironforge, and other Alliance cities. More and more women perform the tasks traditionally reserved for men, such as working at the Forge. The Sisters of Steel are just such a group of female blacksmiths. Long experience at the Forge toughens the sisters' skin and strengthens their muscles to the point where they can plunge their hands into fire without wincing, and blades rebound from their flesh. This kind of makes me think of the um, Mandalorian, the lady that is like the blacksmith that makes his armor. Some whisper that these abilities are due to more than just a mundane connection to the forge, that strange and ancient magic as it works. Some sisters claim that they benefit from the blessings of Kazgaroth, the titan shaper and forger of the world, which makes me think these are mostly dwarves. When the need arises, the sisters of steel lift the weapons they forge to move out to combat their weapons. It does say they are mostly dwarves because of this, um, but they also leave and patrol and fight as needed. They're very good at soaking up damage and dishing it out. You have to be female, of course be one of the sisters they they you automatically get an earth subtype which is interesting so it's like you're becoming earthen they have a skin of steel so they are that's awesome um and strength of granite extra but then they as they get up they have more damage reduction they have fortification which lets them ignore crits protection from arrows a crushing power 
which lets them use bludgeoning weapons best of all. Hammers, makes sense. They get stability, which is like the um, dwarf power, or if they already have it because they're a dwarf, improves stability. Steel Flesh Ascendance. Um, they eventually, at eighth, rank, at eighth level, I mean, at their maximum, they become steel. So they are not basically human anymore. That's crazy. And they're super heavy. Like, they literally are metal. Okay, so we're getting nearer to the end as we hit use with the Ursa Totemic. That Sisters of Steel, that one would be cool to play. Ursa Totemics are the biggest, meanest, and most feral of Firbolgs. They, this is a Firbolg only class. They tower above humans and orcs and can snap elven necks with a single paw swipe. They are immensely strong and tough and focus on improving their natural bear like natures. They disembowel dragons with their claws and crush small creatures that come within their grasp. These creatures achieve a higher level of power and feral grace. Many think that Ursa Totemics are infused with the power of the twin bear demigods, Ursok and Ursul. The Ursa Totemic is a powerful melee fighter and can take a prodigious amount of damage before falling. Ursa Totemics represent the continued evolution of their race and are strong melee combatants that rely on natural weapons and sheer toughness to see them through. The Ursa Totemic rends and mangles his opponents, crushes them in bear hugs, rips them apart with his jaws, and only then notices that he's bleeding from dozens of wounds. So it's like a mixture between a totem person and a uh, and like a barbarian. So Ur Ursa Totemics are strong, tough, wild fur bulgs. Um, they will fight the toughest of prey, and they are a little more likely, because they're more heroic, to go beyond their borders and start seeking out life as an adventurer. Um, they can't be lawful because they're basically barbarians. They get mega strength bonuses as they go. They have bear fighting skills. Um, they can't wear armor, but they get extra strength bonuses to their... So they basically gain natural armor. This is all about their armor. They have improved claws as well, so their claws are their weapons. This is a picture of them. Their bare skin is their armor, and their claws are their weapons. They get double claw attacks. Um, they can go into an Ursa Frenzy, so it's like a bear form, which they can't use. They become like wild and stupider, but much better at fighting. Um, they can then also bite. So then they're doing claw, claw, bite attacks, grab, bear hug moves. Um, Ten levels of prestige class. They can eventually smell blood, knock back with their claws. They can maim. Um, if they get a crit, they do extra damage on top of regular crit damage. The bear hug is like a, a strong grapple move. Flurry of blows, they can now start to get all kinds of extra attacks with their claws. And finally, a claw maul, which if they hit with both claws, then they basically shred you apart and do massive damage. Um, they have non-standard progressions. If you look at their attack bonuses, it's because it's an extension of the furball racial class. So... Uh, yeah, they're, you, you're basically just improving this from the verbal Razor class, so it's a little bit different. All right, we're getting near the end. W's was our last letter. I think we have a couple of these, two or three. The Warden is a cool class, like Maiev, so let's read about that as a playable class, which I really think we've already done before. So I think this is a rehash. Wardens are the Night Elf Special Police Force. They're stealthy and mystical individuals using their shadowy abilities in ways much different than the militant Sentinels, so maybe that's what we had before. Wardens are often assassins, saboteurs, jailers, and bounty hunters. They're adept at entering and exiting combat quickly and have a number of attacks that can quickly disable their opponents. Many wardens are women, though not all of them. Wardens dress in dark colors and favor cloaks, which move about them like shadows to further hide their presence. Wardens are deadly melee combatants, able to bring their opponents to their knees with a few quick strikes and then teleport to safety. Um, they are definitely night elves. Has to be night elves. Night elf only. Um, and they're the most feared jailers and bounty hunters. And at this point, Maiev is already being called infamous. So I don't really feel like she's worthy of the infamy based on Warcraft 3, but maybe things have already happened in Burning Crusade times. Um, but she hunted Illidan. It says she died alone and hollow on that alien red world. But yeah, we know that that story gets... There's other things that happen there because she comes back, she's in Legion, she's in BFA, she's she's in a bunch of the other expansions. So 
She comes back. Despite her, um, despite Maev's failure, a lot of women still want to become wardens like her. Um, they have to be agile, and they tend to stay around and protect the night elf homeland. They have to be good at tracking, stealth. Um, they gain bonus feats, which are all combat related. You pick exactly which one you want, like uh, improved crit, combat reflex, spring attack, stuff like that. They gain spell-like abilities, and you choose, again, Blink, Circle of Knives, Fairy Fire, Mind Vision, stuff like that. Things that they had in, in Warcraft 3. They gain improved weapon finesse. They gain improved spell-like abilities, so they get to upgrade like Circle of Knives to Greater Circle of Knives, for instance. Um, 10 level prestige classes. They eventually gain meta magic on their spell like abilities to extend it, empower it, quicken it, and they gain greater weapon finesse. And ultimately, they can go into vengeance, which is the same ultimate move from Warcraft 3. It's a spell like ability, um, which is going to be talked about in the next chapter. So I think a lot of these uh, will we'll come back when we do the next uh, book episode because we'll talk about what the heck some of these spell like abilities are, which is kind of lame that we're like, hey, you're going to get this power. Look about it. Look at what it's about in the next chapter. Don't like that. Just describe the ability with the class. All right. Wind Warrior, this might be our last one, or maybe we have one more. Uh, once, long ago, warriors fought on foot with nothing but their own bodies and weapons to determine the outcome. Then people domesticated animals and discovered that they could ride the larger beasts, giving them both height and speed unmatched by any landbound foe. Thus, mounted combat began. Now, warriors on horse, panther, wolf, and other beasts are a common sight, and many learn to ride almost as early as they learn to walk, reveling in the speed and ease of such travel. But riding on a beast, watching the ground flash past just below, pales against the thrill of riding an aerial mount, soaring through the air, feeling the wind tugging at your cheeks and lashing at your hair. And in combat, warriors mounted on such airborne steeds have a clear advantage, swooping into attack and then sailing safely beyond reach again. Few can master such creatures, however, and fewer still have the discipline, the grace, and the calm to forge upon with their mounts, becoming less warrior and rider than a single creature united in purpose under the sky. These are the wind warriors. And there is basically this exact class for the horde. So why are we making a second prestige class? A wind warrior is more than this is how they this is how you turn a 175 page book into 500 pages. A wind warrior is more than a mounted warrior. He's a child of the air, a brother of the griffin, an enigma to the landbound. He's become one with his steed, and together they soar ever higher, exulting in the freedom of flight. Wind warriors fight because it is required, but they fly because they must, because without such speed and altitude, they would surely perish. Which is not to say that wind warriors are not formidable foes. Anyone who's ever faced one can attest to their martial prowess, yet fighting is only one aspect of being a wind warrior. Speed, agility, freedom, and the bond with their mounts are the core of the class, the heart of their brotherhood. Anyone who lives to fly is a brother, and anyone who does not appreciate flight will never understand. Um, they're mostly wild hammered dwarves, but sure, anybody that does this all the time could be one. Um, wild hammered dwarves respect the wind warriors because they, they, they're, that's like the high, highest tier of being one. Um, and these kids fly as, from the time other kids are learning climbing and swimming, they're also flying. Um, and despite that, they're humble. They're quiet they are few in number and probably spend a lot of time on their own um, they're flexible quick and they have to have agility and they have to have a high charisma because they have to be good with their animal there are different wind warrior styles every wind warrior loves flying loves the sky loves freedom and loves his or her mount but other details may differ not the least of which is personal style some wind warriors consider themselves knights of the air they wear heavy armor than most wind warriors carry an axe, sword, or mace, plus a lance or glaive. Many carry shields slung across their backs or hanging from their mounts. These wind warriors favor strength and speed over subtlety, and others are the opposite. They favor stealth, working for above where no one would suspect them. They wear little to no armor and carry only light melee weapons and smaller ranged weapons. Their gear is dark, and they carry little ornamentation. Everything's about speed, stealth, and surprise. And the third faction goes with the lighter weight, but not the stealth. They go brightly colored. They scoff at air knights, but they do like the drama. They have their own drama. So they're almost like buccaneers dashing across the sky, leaping down. And then there are even other styles beyond that. So you get to pick. They're not saying what they are. They're saying kind, kind of make your own spec and what kind of wind warrior you want to be before you choose this prestige class. And along with that selection, you should be deciding on your mount. Elves are going to ride dragon hawks. Night elves 
hippogriffs, orcs, wyverns, trolls, vampire bats, and so on and so forth. Um, they gain a skill bonus to animal handle and ride. Um, they have to have a flying creature selected for a mount to even pick this class. And that special mount, um, they they have a bond that lets them improve, lets their mount level up as they level up. They gain defensive flying, which gives them extra armor class as they fly. The, this is a stat block on their extra mount. As the mount levels up, they gain an empathic link. So they can basically speak. They gain extra hit points. They have extra armor, intelligence, speed. Um, they can gain improved evasion. They share the spell-like abilities of their rider. They can speak together. Um, they share saving throws. The, the mount can use the ability to come. They eventually can command other, like a griffin, could command other griffins to help out. They gain spell resistance and a visual bond, like they can see through each other's eyes at the highest echelon. Um, they do gain bonus feats related to flying combat. They have a mount totem, which they make, takes days, and once they have it, uh, it bonds to both of them permanently, and it lets them know, like, if, his, like, you put it on the mount, and then the, the person, the, the warrior can know, like, is his mount okay? Are they captured? Whatever. Um, he can, the warrior can transfer feats to the mount the, to give the mount the feat instead. He can use his totem to call the mount to him. He gains weather sense. Um, he can, at, at fourth level, only he can ride his mount unless he's vouched for them. They gain a special... Um, he gains the ability to speak to all the other races of his mount. So if he's if his mount's a griffin, he can speak to other griffins. He can send telepathic messages with his totem. He gains a spirited charge. Totem transport. Whoa, what's that mean? He can automatically, like, the mount can vanish and transport to him. So he can basically summon his mount. That's cool. Um, all right. And the last, that's the ultimate um, thing. So that's pretty cool. Doesn't what? Uh, oh, it, he saw. He puts it inside the totem. It's kind of like Dritz's panther Gwynvar. He makes it go inside the totem, and then it doesn't have to eat. It doesn't have to breathe, and then he can make it pop back out. So basically, your your mount's like pocket sized. That's pretty cool. All right, we're gonna finish off our episode today with a little story, probably of a wind warrior here. Jaren leaned back, arms spread wide, letting the wind tug at his skin and hair. For a moment, he had no cares, no worries, only the wind in the sky and the warmth of black feather beneath his saddle. Such moments were too rare these days. He remembered when they had been more frequent, when he and his brethren had worried only about raids from the hills. They had spent whole days then doing nothing but flying, wheeling lazily through the air, racing one another for the sheer joy of it. Such times were gone, however, and he reluctantly pulled his gaze back to the earth, speeding by below, just in time to catch the flash of metal amid the trees. There! Leaning forward again, Jaren tugged at Blackfeather's rein, but there was no need. The mighty griffin had seen it as well. Arms and legs tucked close, Jaren laid his head, head alongside his steed's neck, presenting less resistance as Blackfeather wheeled on one wing and then wings tucked to the side dove. The steep angle tugged hair and feathers, and Jaren shared his mount's fierce joy at their speed, but refused to be distracted. One hand tugged his storm hammer free of its sheath, while the other fumbled for the bone whistle hung about his neck. His eyes remained fixed on the rapidly approaching spot below. As they burst past the topmost leaves, Jaren saw the creatures below him and his eyes narrowed at the sight. Goblins. Here, not a day's ride from the villages. His blood raged within him at the thought of these creatures defiling their valley and his grip tightened on the hammer. Not while he still lived. Not while black feathers still flew. Applying pressure with his knees, Jaren straightened in the saddle as the griffin spread her wings to slow their descent. She let out a screech that caught the goblins unawares, and they stared upward, many frozen at the sight of her claws and beak rushing toward them. Jaren did not waste the moment. He raised the whistle to his lips and blew a fierce blast which echoed through the forest. He knew the sound would bring his brethren. Then, letting the whistle fall back against his neck, Jaren raised his storm hammer above his head and directed Blackfeather toward a larger goblin wearing finer mail and a red cloak. Clearly the leader. None shall invade our lands while that wind warriors live. Jaren shouted as they neared their target, and Blackfeather's shriek mingled with his words. Then they struck as one. 
beak and claw and hammer, and the goblin fell before them. And for an instant, it was almost as good as flying. All right, so that's always going to be a doozy. Um, our next episode will be learning about the spells. It should be much shorter. And then we'll be getting into the really cool ones, which are the lore and the history. But this episode is in the pipe. Five by five. Thanks, everybody, for watching and for listening. And I hope to see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.